preface of a general introduction to psychoanalysis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashley Jane. A general introduction to psychoanalysis by Sigmund Freud. Translated by Granville Stanley Hall. Preface. Few, especially in this country, realize that while Freudian themes have rarely found a place on the programs of the American Psychological Association, they have attracted great and growing attention and found frequent elaboration by students of literature, history, biography, sociology, morals and aesthetics, anthropology, education and religion. They have given the world a new conception of both infancy and adolescence and shed much new light upon characterology, given us a new and clearer view of sleep, dreams, reveries and revealed hitherto unknown mental mechanisms common to normal and pathological states and processes, showing that the law of causation extends to the most incoherent acts and even verbigrations in insanity, gone far to clear up the terra incognita of hysteria, taught us to recognize morbid symptoms, often neurotic and psychotic in their germ, revealed the operations of the primitive mind so overlaid and repressed that we had almost lost sight of them, fashioned and used the key of symbolism to unlock many mysticisms of the past and in addition to all this, affected thousands of cures, established a new prophylaxis, and suggested new tests for character, disposition, and ability, in all combining the practical and theoretic to a degree salutary as it is rare. These 28 lectures to laymen are elementary and almost conversational. Freud sets forth with a frankness and almost startling the difficulties and limitations of psychoanalysis and also describes its main methods and results as only a master and originator of a new school of thought can do. These discourses are at the same time simple and almost confidential and they trace and sum up the results of 30 years of devoted and painstaking research. While they are not all controversial, we incidentally see a clearer light the distinctions between the master and some of his distinguished pupils. A text like this is the most opportune and will naturally more or less supersede all other introductions to the general subject of psychoanalysis. It presents the author in a new light as an effective and successful popularizer and is certain to be welcomed not only by the large and growing number of students of psychoanalysis in this country but by the yet larger number of those who wish to begin its study here and elsewhere. The impartial student of Sigmund Freud need not agree with all his conclusions and indeed, like the present writer, may be unable to make sex so all-dominating a factor in the psychic life of the past and present as Freud deems it to be, to recognise the fact that he is the most original and creative mind in psychology of our generation. Despite the frightful handicap of the odium sexicum, far more formidable today than the odium theologicum, involving, as it has done for him, lack of academic recognition and even more or less social ostracism, his views have attracted and inspired a brilliant group of minds not only in psychiatry but in many other fields who have altogether given the world of culture more new and pregnant apicus than those which have come from any other source within the wide domain of humanism. A former student and disciple of Wundt who recognises to the full his inestimable services to our science, cannot avoid making certain comparisons. Wundt has had for decades the prestige of a most advantageous academic chair. He founded the first laboratory for experimental psychology, which attracted many of the most gifted and mature students from all lands. 
By his development of the doctrine of apperception, he took psychology forever beyond the old associationism which had ceased to be fruitful. He also established the independence of psychology from physiology and by his encyclopedic and always thronged lectures to say nothing of his more or less esoteric seminary. He materially advanced every branch of mental science and extended its influence over the whole wide domain of folklore, mores, language and primitive religion. His best texts will long constitute a thesaurus which every psychologist must know. Again, like Freud, he inspired students who went beyond him, the Versbergers and introspectionists, whose method and results he could not follow. His limitations have grown more and more manifest. He has little use for the unconscious or the abnormal, and for the most part he has lived and wrought in a pre-evolutionary age and always and everywhere underestimated the genetic standpoint. He never transcends the conventional limits in dealing, as he so rarely does, with sex. Nor does he contribute much likely to be permanent value in any part of the wide domain of affectivity. We cannot forbear to express the hope that Freud will not repeat Wundt's error in making too abrupt a break with his more advanced pupils like Adler or the Zurich group. It is rather precisely just the topics that Wundt neglects that Freud makes his chief cornerstones. Visit the unconscious, the abnormal sex, and affectionately generally with many genetic, especially ontogenetic, but also phylogenetic factors. The Wundtian influence has been great in the past, while Freud has a great present and yet greater future. In one thing Freud agrees with the introspectionist, Fizz, in deliberately neglecting the physiological factor and building on purely psychological foundations although for freud psychology is mainly unconscious while for the introspectionist it is pure consciousness neither he nor his disciples have yet recognized the aid proffered them by students of the autonomic system or by the distinctions between the epicritic and protopathic functions and organs of the cerebrum although these will doubtless come to have their due place as we know more of the nature and processes of the unconscious mind if psychologists of the normal have hitherto been too disposed to recognize the precious contributions to psychology made by the cruel experiments of nature in mental diseases, we think that the psychoanalysts who work predominantly in this field have been somewhat too ready to apply their findings to the operations of the normal mind. But we are optimistic enough to believe that in the end both these errors will vanish and that in the great synthesis of the future that now seems to impend our science will be made vastly richer and deeper on the theoretical side and also far more practical than it has ever been before. G. Stanley Hall, Clark University, April 1920. End of Preface